right, all right. Welcome to everybody that's online. Hey, how you guys tonight? Hope that everything's good with you. Don't know exactly which one of my cameras. I think it's this one that's going to be shooting today. Yeah, yeah. So how are y'all? Everybody all right? Did you get up your homework? That's what I want to know. Huh? <laughs> Did you do your work? Um, well, I tell you what, um, it is, um, it, it was, about, I, of course, you know, I look back over all the questions and stuff, and I've answered them four or five times as we've uh, been through all these classes. No, it's not, it's not the same, not the same answer every time, but uh, I'm looking at them and I'm going, good night, that's kind of personal, <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm thinking nobody's going to want to share that in class. You know, because, uh, I mean, you might, be, you might be sitting right beside somebody that's some of the answers to these questions right here, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And it's, and it's kind of like, man, I don't want to start any scrimmaging in families here or something like that. But uh, anyway, just remember, uh, I'll probably ask you about some of these questions. And just remember, if you don't. You don't have to answer these. Um, if you do have, if you do have kind of a little general answer, you know, something that maybe almost anybody can identify with, and uh, and it's just kind of one of those general things that's not going to offend anybody in your family or your wife or husband or something like that. Uh, you know, you you can kind of share that with us a little bit because it it really does help to uh, kind of bring some of these things into focus. Uh, everything's not always perfectly uh, black and white. There are some gray areas of life. By the way, that's something, that's something I've learned in my latter years, that um, there are some gray areas. At first, I mean, seriously, when I was young, I, I started pastoring. I'm 18 years old. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a new Christian. I, I, got, I got, came to the Lord when I was 16, so I hadn't grown up in church. I'd been in church since I was 13, um, because I went to uh, I went to the church where I came to the Lord, the church that ordained me, and and the church that was part of my life. I, I came there when I was 13, but it took about three years when I was 16 for me to come to the conclusion that I wasn't I didn't know the Lord. You know, I I had been going to church. I you know I'm I'm like most people that don't grow up in church. I, I'm thinking all right to be right with God. I need to go to church and try and do the right things and quit cussing and quit, you know, doing whatever it is I'm, you know, that's not nice and not good, and I'm going to be all right, you know. And, um, and it took three years before I came to the conclusion that that wasn't going to be good enough and that really with my relationship with God was a real relationship, and I had to invite him to... to change my life, and I had to give myself to him completely uh, as an act of surrender to him, and then he would cleanse my life, and, and then he would begin to work in me. Like, like this morning, you know, one of the things I said this morning, and I, I really, uh, really, Linda Fowler came after church, and she was talking to me about it, and I thought, when she said what she said, I said, good night, I... I should have said that. I said, I'm going to have to preach the same message next week so I can make sure I say this. <laughs> so I can make a point right here. I finally got a point. But, but the point was, uh, you know, at, at one point this morning I was talking about, about what you have to give up to become a Christian, to give yourself to Jesus. And I said, There's, there are people in this world who won't come to the Lord because they're afraid of what they have to give up. Now, just another little side point to that. Whatever that is, that's what's robbing you peace. That's what's robbing you joy out of your life. Whatever that is that's got such a hold on you that you are afraid that you'll have to give it up if you come to the Lord and you won't come because you don't want to give that up, that's the culprit right there. That's the big battle that's going on in your life. But the, what I, the point that she was saying to me is that um, she said I, that she's had family members, and, and we know, you know, Linda's a great witness for Christ. Her whole life is, a, is about that, but she hadn't always been that way, and she, doesn't, she didn't come out of a lineage of that. And so anyway, in talking to people, um, she found that uh, pointing out the fact that, hey, man, you're going to have to, you know, to come to Christ, you're going to have to surrender, wave the white flag, give it up. 
And the, then the question will become, well, you know, man, this is going to be hard, and I have to give this and give it. And then here's the, here's the further answer. But you're not, you don't have to give it up by yourself. You have help in giving this, this stuff up. I mean, don't think that all of a sudden you're going to give yourself to the Lord, and then he's just going to throw you to the wolves and say, have at it, and, you know, uh, happy life, best of luck to you, you know. No, he, he works in you. And the, the scripture says, for it, as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, I think might be in Rome. I hadn't really thought of looking for it, but it, it's, it's in one of Paul's writings. He said, for it, is, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, God gives you the will to want to do good, and then he gives you the ability to be able to accomplish that. So you're not by yourself when you, you're not, you don't have to just fight the battles by yourself and just give up and so forth. It, you, you have help and the Holy Spirit helps you. So anyway, you guys got that and you guys got that. That's on the, that's on the thing. Bill, what you got? We've already talked about it, and I'm going to go through the auditorium now, but the key word there is want to. Right. If you want to, change it. Right. If, if you want to, don't change, then there's nothing there. You might as well tell the story. Because I know you want to. I don't have You don't have your makeup on, no, yeah. No. <laughs> oh, mercy. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell, tell the story. Tell, come up here and tell the story. Uh, one of the best examples I've ever heard about getting saved and, and, and the whole great thing, uh, there was an elderly preacher. I've heard a bunch of them. And uh, he was talking about this guy that, used to go out and play cards with his buddies. <clears throat> they drank and did this and did that, you know, went out honky tonking and did the whole spill, about five or six of them. And so his wife <clears throat> was a Christian and he was not. And so his wife just kept telling him, you know, please come go to church with me, please come. Like he says, you know, if you're coming up, sooner or later something's going to wear off. Mm -hmm. going to hit the target. Anyhow, so he said, Finally, just to satisfy her and get her off his back, he finally went. And he got saved that night. Mm. And of course, like we should be, the first thing he, one of the first things he thought about was his friends. He wanted to make sure his friends were saved. But he told his wife, and I said, man, we've been through so much and done so much, you know, and he said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to go back and, you know, witness mm -hmm. to him all. So they prayed about it, prayed about it, and finally, he went back. <clears throat> so things were pretty quiet there at first. You know, they were playing cards or doing out the cards. One of the guys asked him, said, well, hey, Joe, said, uh, since you got saved, said, uh, can you still play cards? Are you here playing cards? He said, well, I haven't played yet. He said, but you can play all you want to yet. He said, all right. So then another guy said, well, he was trying to break the ice, you know. Because everybody's still kind of tense. <laughs> and he said, uh, <clears throat> what about drinking? And Joe said, yeah. He said, you can still drink. Sure can. All of you can. All you want to. All you want to. So they went through the thing about chasing women and cursing and doing the whole spiel. And finally one of them said, well, hey, Joe said, now all this that you've said, said you can still do it. Said, said, I don't really see the change. And Joe said, well, the change is you want to. You can do all you want, want to. to. All those things that you do <laughs> and that we used to do, you can still do them if you want to. So if you want to, it doesn't change. There's no Jesus in there. Yeah. You cannot be the same. I tell everybody, you cannot get saved and be the same person that you were. It's going to have to show. You're not yeah. going to have to tell people. It's going to show. Yeah. And I, and I, I like to tell that story because they really had a, an effect on me. Right. And, uh, you want to change it. Yeah. All yeah. right. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. And that's exactly true. Yay. Yay. I mean, with no makeup, you did that. No makeup whatsoever. <laughs> hey, that's that's the glory of God shining off your head. Dude. That's what that means. <laughs>
I like that story. And I like to tell I like it. it is. Well, it may, it, it's a very clear truth exactly. that, that you can do whatever you want to, that, but God changed you want to. That's right. And that's what happens. And, that's, and that's, that's true. He doesn't make us where we can't sin anymore. I, you know, I really wish he did. Yeah. Uh, that would be, that would make it a lot easier, wouldn't it? If he would make it where we couldn't sin anymore. But, uh, but we can still do anything we, we ever did. It's just you don't want to anymore. And that, that's a good word. That's a good word. All right. Uh, you remember, lad, we're on our mind tonight. We're on these, uh, on the Ten Commandments of five different areas of, of Christian life, which I think really are the areas that are probably the dominant areas of our life, the, the areas for sure that people encounter us on and that relationships come to our lives on. Uh, our mind, our mouth, what we say, <laughs> yeah, and our money, and I know that might be a surprise, but it shouldn't be, because the Bible is filled with passages and instructions and concerns about money and about what our treasure is and how to handle this and what to do with it and and how to control it in our life so it doesn't end up controlling us and you know and then our relationships uh, the ones we have that affect us uh, all of them all the relationships especially male female because male male relationships are really not very complicated really are <laughs> really male you know male male relationships uh, we, we can do almost anything uh, immediately because we, we can compartmentalize. Um, the Lord's given us that ability, and I, I know you've heard me talk about that before and not wrong, just different and messages like that, that somehow the Lord has given us the ability, and we have to have it in order to be men. We have to have it because one of our duties as men is to protect our family. And in order to protect our family, lots of times we have to do irrational things. I mean, you, you look at war as an example. This is an extreme example, but, but it does make the point. I mean, who's going to charge a machine gun nest knowing that they're going to be killed most likely? I mean, who's going to get out on a landing craft on a beach when it's being riddled with shells and bombs and everything else? I mean, who's going to do that? Well, men will. Why? Because they're in that compartment in their brain that says, my job is to protect my family. This is going to protect my family. And so here I go, buddy. And, and, and we will do that. And we have to be able to do that. We have to, we have to be not afraid of things, you know. And, 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 and so the Lord gave us the ability to put something in one part of our brain and not talk to it anymore. I mean, you know, I mean, I, you ladies might have been, you know, a little bit uh, uh, concerned about the fact that your husband could have an argument with you and then go play 18 holes of golf, you know, and have a good time. <laughs> and then you come back and say, how in the world you do that? He said, well, I just don't talk to that part of my brain for 18 holes. I mean, it's just part of the way we can do things like that. We can compartmentalize. But anyway, in the area of relationships, um, if you have relationships with the opposite sex, and by that I'm not talking about romantic, it could be romantic, but I'm just talking about it just dealings, you know, just dealings with, with the opposite sex. Uh, even in your own family, the, the different uh, people in your family, sons, daughters, grandchildren, you know, there are all kinds of people in your family. And, um, I mean, this, there's a way that you do that. The Scripture teaches us how to do that effectively, and that it'll be easier for us and more productive for us and, and just better. So we'll look at the ten big deals on that. Five for men and five for women, so it'll be interesting for us. Um, and then we look at the last thing, our ministry, which really is, uh, is the way we live our life, what we're called to do, the way, what God expects from us. I mean, you, you really would like to know, now that I'm a Christian, what does God expect from me? Because one of the big questions that everybody asks, in national polls, and I'm sure the same thing would be true in international polls, every time they do one that said, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? Is always the, the same answer wins every time. And the, 
and, and it would be, why am I here? Why am I here? In other words, what am, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Am I doing the right thing? Am I wasting my life or am I using my life like you designed it to be? And, and of course, God does design us to be used in certain ways. And it's not difficult, I think, to know this. And when we get to those top 10 things said about the way we live our life, um, I think it'll be real good and real interesting. So last week we started with the mind, and I told you that the first, and I'm not going to go through all, all of them again, but just because I told you last week that the first law was the most important. Do you remember what the first law dealt with? With a servant, yeah, with a servant. And I started with that one because I said that one's the most important of our mind. Because unless we have the mind of a servant, uh, all these other things are not going to be fruitful in our life. We're not going to submit to these things. We're not going to accomplish these things because we have to put on the same mind that Jesus had when Jesus was on this earth and became obedient to his father, even to the point of death on a cross, so that we could have life. So the law of, of the servant basically says to us, never forget that you're a servant and that God's paid a tremendous price. Jesus has paid a great price for you. And no matter what happens in life, we're expected to, to, to serve. We're here to serve. And in our mind, we have to create a, 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 an attitude of a servant and, you, and to know how you feel about being a servant is really easy to tell. Just look at how you act when somebody treats you like one. And you'll tell how far you are along. When somebody treats you like a servant, how do you react to that? Or you get all bent out of shape, you're insulted, you're, you know, they're, you know, insulting me, they're, you know, ridiculing me, whatever it might be, whatever thought. That'll tell you how far along you've come in this servanthood kind of deal. Because God says, hey, you're to be a servant. Now, all right, we went through the five last week. Servant, uh, generations, which just say, you know, we didn't pop out of thin air. We're affected by the generations, by our lineages, by our genetics, by our heritage, uh, by things that have happened in our family, by strongholds and uh, other issues that have happened in families that just seem to be passed down through the generations. And there can be bad things that pass through the generations and good things that pass through the generations. And so we're to reject those issues of our generations that are negative and have held us in bondage and tend to capture us in these little segments of life. And then we're to thank God for those great things. You know, you, maybe your family gave you a great work ethic. Maybe dad was a hard working man and he taught you how to be a hard working man. And so you grew up and your life's been blessed because you were trained to be a hard-working man and show up on time and be there every day. My, my, dad, my dad taught me all that. I mean, my life is still blessed because of that. I guarantee you, I show up to work, buddy. I mean, I don't, I don't skip work. I don't call in sick or anything. I have to either be, either be vomiting or dying, blood coming out of me or something before I miss work. It's just, a, it's just something built into me. Where'd that come from? It came from my dad who taught me how to be that, you know? And, uh, and, and just go through, man. Don't, don't quit. Don't, you don't, there are no excuses for that kind of stuff, Dad would say, you know? And uh, so that's a good lineage. So I say, thank you, Lord. That's a wonderful generational blessing is what it really boils down to. You know, we've all heard of generational curses, you know, lunacy and heretic, uh, hereditary things and genetics and all this kind of stuff, you know, and laziness and so forth. Well, those are generational curses, and those have to be broken off of you. But, but generational blessings, man, they're wonderful. Your dad would be proud of you. Thank you, Bear. I appreciate it. He was. Yeah. Well, he... <laughs> Uh-huh. And how all of them, and I wondered about, you know, have, have you raised children, you wonder, well, mm -hmm. are they going to get a job, or are they going to do this, or right. how are they going to turn out? You know, yeah. You've done your best with them, what are they going to do? Right. And all of them have jobs, don't 
fine boys, fine daughters. Yep. To miss work. I was working <laughs> uh, for 28 years at our school. Mm -hmm. And the only time that I was off was if I was truly, truly sick. Mm -hmm. And then I'd come in maybe a half a day or something. I just, yeah. I just didn't take off. Yeah. And so I, that's what I find in them. That's mm -hmm. why I ask. I'm sure your daddy was proud. Right. Because I'm proud of my kids, the fact that they're not lazy in, right. you know, they go to work. Yep. They don't miss work. But right. it's a part of their life, and I see that. Right, and that's a generational blessing, see. Yeah. And I don't know how your parents were with you, Mine but too. but you might have started that, mm -hmm. or it might be a fulfillment. I, I don't know where all of that started. My dad, but uh, but it was passed to me, and then I have passed it. Justin yeah. Yeah. has it. Amy has it. Um, I'm hoping my grandchildren will get it. Um, you know, of course, you always wonder about the little ones coming up. You know, if you have a child that won't work or is lazy and sorry and everything else, you know what a man, how, what a bondage that is. You know, really, what a bondage that is. Man, you got to fuss at them all the time. You got to try to, you know, what are you going to do with them? They're going to lay up in the house till they're 35 years old, ain't got a job. You know, right. You know, and then you got to think about, well, I got to kick them out or I got to put them out or I got to whatever. And no parent wants to do that. You know, we, nobody would want to do that. And it's just terrible that you kind of get pushed to that point at times. But anyway, there you go. It's generation, generation. I'm, I'm deterred. Yeah. So, um, now, since we're kind of doing the pass on from generations and everything, what if it's uh, something that's not necessarily the Right. All right. So, what if you're the one starting the generational curse? I mean, really, is what you're asking? <laughs> what if you're the one that's fixing to pass a curse down to some others? Yeah. Well, you know, when you begin to recognize the fact that there are issues in in your life that need to be changed. Uh, Classes like this and instructions like this and coming to the Lord and uh, those will be instructions for you on how to change those parts of your life. I mean, it, it, you'll, you'll get to see some of that kind of stuff here uh, when we, as we move into some of these laws for today that our lives, you know, when we begin to recognize that things are out of whack, then it's our responsibility to, to move where the Lord is and to obey his word because that's what we said we would do when we said he's Lord of our life, that means he's boss, he's master. And that means I can't be master anymore, and I can't be the boss. So I surrender. I become the servant. He becomes the boss. And I do what he says. That's what I promised. That was my surrender to him, actually. And so he'll, he'll teach us. He'll train us in the Word, and he'll, get, he'll make sure you get the Word. And, and as an example, uh, you're here tonight. As an example of that. And have been here in other classes. Why? Because God is working in you to give you the desire to want to be different. And, and he's showing you what it is that needs to be different. And he's going to empower you to be able to deal with what needs to change so that your life moves off of that track and moves on to, to, to where he would have you to go. I mean, all of this is a process. And, it, and it's just, it just starts like that beautifully. And before you know it, you look around and, and some of that negative stuff and some of that stuff that seems to be strongholds are no longer attached to you. And it's like, hey, man, I, I used to be that. What happened to that? You know, you, it's like, what happened to that? Yeah. Well, it, the Lord peeled it away. You know, it, it moved out of your life. The Lord, the Lord helped you understand it needed to and then, and then empowered you to be able to, to do it and sometimes it might involve different people in your life you know sometimes the stronghold is a person I don't know if you're aware of this but and, and almost all of us have somebody or have had somebody in our life that was a stronghold uh, I have you know weren't good for me not just somebody that 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 just doesn't encourage you to be a better person they just seem by their presence to be there to help you debase, you know, <laughs> I mean, just fall off the wagon or something or another. And anyway, but there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm digressing out. In the, in the, all right. And by the same token, 
if you do not do what you would expect yourself to do, don't beat yourself up. Don't be too hard on yourself. But that's when the devil can really work on you hard. Mm-hmm. He can tell you, I'm, I'm talking from experience. He can take you <laughs> Lots of experience. You can do what you, you can buy with your children. You can do everything you can do with your children. But that's why they have their own mind. So they make the choice, you know, because I, my, well, I'm not, anyhow, I've had people tell me, I, I did all I could do, and, and look, we thought we were doing a great job, and look what she's doing, and look what he's doing. Well, they made that choice. It's yeah. nothing that you did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So don't beat yourself up, you know. Yeah, don't take all the blame That's for everything, because exactly. it, it just, Robs your joy from you, exactly. you know. Exactly. <laughs> is all it does. It steals they your hope. That's right. That's exactly right. Because we all do Did what we want to do. You know, really. We've heard that all of our life. You do what you want to do. But exactly. is there anything more true than that? No. no. Exactly. We do what we want to do. If we want to do it, we'll be in heaven and earth to be able to get to do it. If we don't want to do it, any excuse will do. You know. <laughs> Is what it boils down to. Isn't, and isn't it funny when you hear somebody make an excuse for something they don't want to do, and it's just so ridiculous. I mean, the excuse is so ridiculous. And here's the thing about it is, if it's you making the excuse, you think it sounds reasonable. <laughs> but everybody else that hears it goes, what kind of junk is that? That's the stupidest thing I've heard in my life. Just say you don't want to do it, man. I mean, I, yeah. but to you it sounds so reasonable what you're what you're saying, and they should understand. Oh yes, this is. <laughs> but anyway, all right, we 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 digress. All right, the third one was tolerance, which means you got to allow a little room. Uh, you know, something might not be plum plum, but it's plum some, and sometimes plum some has to be good enough, and that is the truth right there. You know, I've seen people really almost destroy a lot of good stuff that, they, that they've accomplished and helped do in people's lives by trying to be plum plum. I mean, just no tolerance whatsoever. I mean, no gray area, just all black or all white and just hammering on people that are trying to change and, to, and trying to become something, you know? But because there's no tolerance, it just gets so discouraging. All you ever hear is you're just not measuring up. You're not good enough. You're not doing it right. And so the law of tolerance says, look, man, you, you, you have to get it in your mind that sometimes you're going to have to settle for what you get and keep working at making it better. But, but don't keep criticizing people and and lamb blasting them and, and you know, ridiculing them and, and pushing them to, to you push past a point, uh, a point. So some tolerance. And then the third, the fourth was the law of respect and about the fact that uh, people know when you're respecting them and they know when you're not. And if you're not respecting them, uh, they're not going to pay attention to you. Now they might if you you know if you if you're someone who can punish them in some way you know. Like you're their boss, and if they don't listen to you, you can fire them. Well, they might listen to you even though they know you don't respect them. But if you're in a if you're in a side by side relationship, you know where you don't have any advantage. If you're not respecting them, you know you're, you've lost credibility with them. You, I, I guarantee you that you can say a lot of things to people that seem to be hard or a little bit harsh or you know a little critical if they know in their heart that you respect them. And if they, if they don't feel you do, man, they won't listen to any of that kind of stuff. So anyway, law of respect. Uh, the fifth one was the law of freedom, which just means that if you're free, uh, the others around you are free. If you're in bondage, you carry a certain amount of the people in your life into bondage with you because they're linked to you. And what you do affects them. And what happens to you affects them. So if you're not free, they're not free totally because what you're doing is, is impacting their lives. And I use just a little simple example of, uh, you know, if you're riding with somebody somewhere and they're late, you, you know, you're going to be late too. Why? But a person 
person driving say, well, I mean, you know, hey, it's just me. No, you're, I'm riding with you, so if you're late, I'm late. And it's that same concept in life. So we, need to, we strive to be free. We strive to be free from bondages and, and free from habits and free from things that uh, will hinder us and hold us down. And, you know, it's just amazing. How many of you have ever seen somebody that obviously had big issues in their family, let's just say, and it, was, and it really was just killing them? You ever seen anybody like that? I mean, they can't come to work, can't show up. They're always an emotional wreck. Uh, they can't focus on anything because there's so much strife and division and going on at home. And then they, I mean, it's just a lot of different things. And you can just pick up on the fact, look, man, this person, if this person had some kind of peace in their life and some kind of home life, they could be a much better person than they are. But because there's all this, this discord, it really affects their life. So anyway, strive to be free so that the people that are associated with you can be free. Jesus came that we might be free, you know, and so anyway. The, the sixth law today is, uh, is going to be the law of hope, the law of hope. Uh, hope is not just wishful thinking. You know, you hear a lot of people use it that way. You know, man, I hope you have a good day. Well, that's just kind of like good luck, man, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, our... our uh, I hope it works out. Well, that's like saying my wish is that it'll work out. I mean, it's, it, it, in other words, we use hope a lot of times in the sense that, um, that it's wishful thinking. We, we want it to be that way. But hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is um, confident expectation, I guess, really what the dictionary would define it as, a confident expectation. And I've given, I think I've given you guys before I've mentioned it in, in a message or teaching about my definition of hope. And I think it's a good definition. I think it's a way to look at hope. I think it's a way to think about hope in your life that's really, that's really um, uh, grounded. And, and here it is. All right. Hope is a well-founded well-grounded expectation for the future. It's well-grounded. In other words, there's a reason why I can believe this. It, it has something that it's built on. It's not just wish out of thin air. There's something concrete that makes me feel like that it can be better. And then a well-founded and well-grounded, well-founded means that that there's a promise for it. There's a, there's a, a reason to believe this. There's, a, there's some type of, uh, of look at it into, into the future that makes me believe that this, is, that this can happen. It's not just plucked out of thin air and we just wish for something. It has a grounding and, it, and, and there's a reason why I can believe this expectation for the future. And the Bible talks a lot about hope in our life. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, one of your passages, Romans 5, you've got your, you got your scripture note, you got your scripture passages, look at Romans 5. Let me just read it out loud to you, and, uh, and then, and then we'll, we'll look at this for just a second. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, now here's, the, here's the, the, the line I want to get to. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope does not disappoint. What does that mean? Yeah, man, yeah right. It, mean, it means you have a, you have a, a foundation. But, but, it, but it also, think about this. Would that also mean that it's, it's never too late for someone? That there's always... Uh, there, th somebody they can always change, right? I mean that if, if hope never disappoints, it means that I'm not 
that, that there's always a chance, there's always a possibility that somebody can change, that, that, that any situation in, in my life can change. Now, we, we can't be mentally uh, stable in, in our life, I, I don't think, without hope. Because hope kind of hope keeps us alive. Uh, what does Hebrews eleven say that that faith is a substance of things hoped for, and faith comes by hearing, hear by the word. So in church, what church? The purpose of part of the purpose of church is to build my faith so that my hope will have something to stand on, and 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 so for for us to hope. If, if we don't have any hope in our life, then our faith doesn't have anything to do. You know, it, 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 no matter how much faith we have, it won't. And so, so hope is a very critical part of our life. And so God is telling to us, uh, God is saying to us, don't lose hope. Because I've seen things change. I've seen them change in a moment of time. I've seen people that I thought would never change, change. I thought, I've seen situations I thought were over, change. And God says, don't look, don't lose that hope. As a matter of fact, the passage of Scripture, and uh, I, I know it was in, it's in your notes, but I don't know if you've ever read it before. It's out of Job 14, verse 7. And it's a kind of an unusual little, little thought here, but, but hang with me just a second. All right, Job says, for there is hope for a tree. It's in your, in your notes, in your Scripture notes. For there is hope for a tree if it's cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease. In other words, God's saying, you see that stump over there? That stump can come back to life. If you've ever seen a stump and you've cut something down, and uh, cut a tree down, and, and you want it gone out of your life and out of your yard, you come back out there in about two or three weeks, what's going to be happening? It's got a shoot sticking up out of it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Now, what that's basically illustrating and saying to us is you may look at your life like a stump. And you may say, it's dead and gone and it's over with and the life is out of it. But Job says, look, there's hope that, it, that even if you see an old dead stump in the ground, that somehow new life can begin to spring up out of that thing. And, and, and all I'm saying to you is, imagine... I mean, use, this, use that thought as something that you can imagine. Imagine in your life that whatever it is that you think is dead and gone, you think it is no longer in existence, that it is yesterday's news, it's history in your life, whether it's a relationship or whether it's a, 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 an opportunity or whatever it might be, it, 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 it's just an old stump. So just imagine in your life, that that stump can come back to life again and that it can flow again and that it can, a relationship can be rebuilt, uh, a life can be reclaimed, uh, uh, an opportunity for work can be rekindled, uh, education can be sought at, even at this age. And it, I mean, it, in other words, look at the things in your life that you've lost hope in. And the scripture says, look, that stuff can come back to life. Just imagine a tree, you know, <laughs> look at that old stump over there. Who would, and then all of a sudden there's life that begins to pop out of it. And, and, and the Lord's saying, that's how we are. We're like that. And so, yeah, right. As long as the root's still alive, there's hope. That's right. As long as, the, as long as you're still alive, the grace of God is still in effect, right? So that means as long as we're still alive, there's, there's hope that we can change that things can be different in our life. And so that's a very strong mental attitude in our life that, uh, that hope is a powerful uh, message in our life and that no one, I can't give you hope. When you come to church, you know, I'm not up here preaching so that you'll get hope. You have hope. God puts hope inside you. You come with your hope. And, and, and then what I do is I preach the word hopefully, every time, that gives you faith and encourages your faith to believe if God did it then, he can do it now. If God did it then, he can do it again. If they could depend on God for that, I can depend on God for that because God's no respecter of persons. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If it happened to them, it can happen to me. 
And so you're encouraged to, to believe, and your faith is, is, is encouraged. And, of course, that gives your hope something to stand on in life. So, anyway, uh, law six, law of hope. Uh, let me, let's look down here. Uh, Tanya wrote these questions in, and they are really great. Um, and I don't know if, you, if, you, if you're willing to answer any of these out loud, but look at the first question on your sheet. If hope sees a picture of the future, describe what you see for yourself in five years. Did anybody answer that? Did anybody say anything in that? What do you see? If hope is, if, if, if hope is a picture for the future, what do you see? Who, somebody give me an answer. What'd you write? I'd say a brighter future. You see a brighter future. I mean, really? Growing. Yeah. Growing so you're 70 years old, and, you've, and you see a brighter future for yourself. Well, hot dog, I do too. I just, you know, I wanted you to know that. He got brighter two years. Oh, Brian. <laughs> yeah, right, absolutely. When you moved in down here, it was awesome. So you got a, you got a, a whole new life, didn't you? Yeah. Hot dog. That's great, and it's been all involved ever since. That's exactly right. But half the stuff you see around here you were involved with, praise the Lord for it. I'm, my hopes and courage also. Does anybody else write something else? All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was kind of explaining it more myself, but I mean, for something for more future. Uh huh. Right. Um, like, you know, school and everything. Yep. Um, more on um, not worrying so much about materials. Mm hmm. Instead of, like, things that matter. Right. Um, so you're seeing in your future uh, some more education and, mm -hmm. and, and education in areas that are, that are about uh, what? About real more reality in your life? Or, yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. See, that's, uh, that's a hope for the future. And is there any grounding for that? Sure. Is there any found? Yeah, sure. This is possible. This can happen. This is not just a wish. It can do. All right, look at the second question. Can you identify any situation or people in your life for which you no longer see a picture for the future? Now, don't answer that. That's not going to be one. you gonna Because that'd be like somebody said, yeah, you out of my life forever, and you ain't never getting back in. I'm going to wave goodbye to you. You know, I've told you about the gift of goodbye. Um, sometimes... You have to give them the gift of goodbye. If somebody can walk away from your life, they're not part of your future. That's all I'm telling you. Yeah, Brittany, did you have uh, something? Well, because I'm, I'm not answering or anything, but uh, what if it's more like you are thinking more of future things and everything, and you're saying waiting for people to buy or whatnot, but what if you never really see, like, the picture of them, like, that actual person? Maybe it's on somebody else. But it doesn't have, like, Right. So you are you are basically saying that you kind of see some people just generic, just generic things in your life that you don't think that that kind of a person's going to be in your future, and maybe not a specific person. Mm-hmm. And so and so that. So, and so, so you just wrote down like a caricature of somebody, like some, yeah. Okay, this is the kind of person. Well, hey, that's fine. I mean, I would, you, you definitely don't want to rule out specifics unless it's already been the gift of goodbye, you know, uh, people in your life. But that's good, yeah, because that way it shows you what you're looking for. And when somebody comes across your life, you say, nope, that's not for me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah, that's, there's your stump with the, with the shoot coming up out of it again. You know, there's your hope. And that's what we were saying, that there's always hope that people can change. Mm -hmm. And if they do change, then they might actually become part of your life again. So more just looking at a temporary goodbye, but not be upset if it is. 
Well, we're always praying and we're always believing and we're always trying to influence people in our life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they, yeah, it could be for a season, like Brian said, you know, uh, because the hope is that they're going to actually change and that life's going to be different and then they could be, be a part of our life again, you know. The thing you have to be careful is that you just make sure that whatever standard it is that you have in your life, you don't just lower that sucker down too much, yeah, <laughs> which is what a lot of times we, we allow to happen in our life. All right, the law of... Age, you said, Jackie? Yes. Okay. Because it just seems like she's younger, she's going to go to school, she knows she wants to. I, I don't want to go to school now. Yeah. Right. But really? She will sit huh? well. no, <laughs> What? Sit well. <laughs> you would do great. She is seeing that she may be taking different steps. Right. Where I see probably just the same thing. Where, yeah. You don't see many steps changing in your life, is what you say, well, isn't? Not, not, not drastically. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, and it's funny how that is because age does matter to us. You know, I see things differently now than I did when I was your age, um, and the idealism of life, you know, and um, experiences in life, and and of course your the physicalities of life. Everything, you know, as you get older, it changes and. And uh, some things become better, not not many, but some things become better. <laughs> the only thing that you, the only thing that really gets better is it, it, it is a real relationship that you have with someone else. That that can get better, but the physicalities, the health, the uh, all of those th things about life, all you know, genetics, age, and gravity are going to really, you know, <laughs> have a lot to do with your future, you know, and stuff like that. Okay, well, let me get on. But your hope is, no matter what your age, is that you continue to grow and expand as an individual. Yeah, you don't. Li where you are. Yep, you don't limit yourself. Yeah, you don't become stagnant. But you continue to grow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at Brian as an example. He's changed altogether. Look at him, sitting there, strong, virile, intimidating-looking guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> kind of like one of those songs is, though, like, if we're saved and we're trying to live for Christ, and we're not living for Christ, then we don't have to live for Christ. 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 Then we don't have to Christ. Then we don't have to live for Christ. Then we don't have to live for Christ. Then we don't have to live for that is. That is. And, and all those points are, are true. And that's why you have the law of hope and, and the law of, well, well, we'll cover it when we get to the end, should we ever get there. Um, and I'm not, I'm not rebuking you. I'm not rebuking you. I'm not rebuking you. I know it sounds like I am, but I don't care. I really, I don't, I don't care where we get to, honestly. Uh, just so whatever it is we cover is important to us. And it matters. You know, I don't care if we don't get but one more of them or any more of them. Because, hey, next week we'll be back, Lord willing. <laughs> Lord willing, we'll be back next week so we can just take up wherever we live off. But, yeah, the, all these, this is right, you know, uh, all the things that you're observing into there. And, it, and, it, and they're all good observations because uh, it does matter uh, how you look at life in, in the law with hope. And how you don't give up on certain situations because it's not working like you think. Uh, that at times you wave goodbye and at times you shake hands hello, you know. And, uh, and, it, and so that's why the Lord has to be such a strong presence in our life. And the leadership of the Holy Spirit has to be a real impactful thing in our life. And this is why I tell married couples, uh, the, here's my counseling to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do your wedding, and here's what I'm going to counsel you. Come to church. Don't miss church. Every week, come to church. I don't, care, I don't care how you feel. Now, if you got something that we, you might give to us, stay at home. But, but other than that, you know, if it's, not, if it's not contagious, be there. I mean, sit in the back by yourself or something. Or sit out in the, in, the, in the cafe out there and listen, you know, through a speech. And uh, you can probably hear it through the doors and the walls and everything else around here anyway. But, uh, but do that because life changes, and it changes all the time. 
And whatever, you know, might be an issue today, tomorrow might not even be an issue at all. And then three weeks from now, it, it's it's drastic issue. And it because life just changes all the time. And there's no way at one point of time that you can give all the counsel you might need for every situation that might arise in life. You're going to need it every week. So just, you know, come and ask the Lord to give you guidance about whatever's going on in your life. Prepare you for whatever's going to happen this week because he knows, you know, the Holy Spirit in you is aware of what God wants for you. By the way, he's the only one who is. You don't know what he wants for you. Only God knows what he wants for you. And so the Holy Spirit is in you as part of your life to guide you toward what God wants for you. Because you don't know, he does know, what's he in your life for? To guide you toward what God has for you. It's the blue swim bicycle deal, you know. I've, have I ever told y'all about the blue swim bike? Yeah, you went and y'all were all in the class, yeah. You, well, then remember it. Look at Jean saying no. No, she doesn't know. She doesn't know. A blue swim bike, in a nutshell, is um, as parents, as an example, as parents, uh, we find a blue swim bicycle in a yard sale, and we say, you know, it's getting time for our child to learn how to ride a bike, and it's going to be good for them, and they need to progress this way. And the only problem is your child's never looked at a bike. Your child's never said they wanted a bike. Your child, you're not even sure your child knows what a bike is. So you buy the bike for 2 or $3 at a yard sale, and, you, you know, your child's got a birthday coming up in a few months and you put it up in the attic where they won't see it, and then your job from now until their birthday is to convince them that what they want for their birthday is, that blue, is a blue swim bike. So you take them to the bike shop and you show them the shiny whistles and the flaps and the mirrors and the horn and the ring ring and all of that, and you get them pumped up. Here, come sit on this thing. This is just awesome. This is mad. And then and, and, and you do everything you can. You do everything you can to sell them on a blue swim bike. And then on their birthday, when, they, when you bring their gift in, they just, oh, that's what I want in a blue swim bike. Well, that's what you've had for them all along. That's the Holy Spirit's job in our life. The Holy Spirit knows what God has for us. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to convince us to ask God for it so that when he gives it to us, It'll be what he wanted, and we'll be happy about it. So there you go in a nutshell. And that happens all the time in our lives. So That's anyway. another thing that I have had trouble with, I, I kind of understand now, is the pri prison ministries and the prisoners, mm -hmm. do they really want to go to those um, lectures or whatever right. to save themselves, or do they do that to get out of their... I'm sure, I'm sure there's probably some of each, really, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, that's why people do prison ministry is they, they hope that, that it'll make a difference and that whatever happens, it'll, you know, it'll change somebody's life and somebody's eternity and, and someone's future and their, you know, and because uh, some of them are never going to get out. I mean, some of them that come to the services are lifers, man, and I mean, they don't have any hope of getting out, but they're coming, uh, I don't know for the entertainment value, or uh, or either they're real and they want to they want to be saved. I mean, they they see themselves as they were. They don't like what they see. They want to be different. They don't want to be that way. And even though they'll never get out, they want the Lord in their life and they want to go to heaven when they die. And they they're truly sorry and repentant and everything else about all of that. Uh, and that's our hope. That's, that's what that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah, he does, and 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 that's and that's probably one place that it's it, usually you can have a little bit of time like that, that undivided attention time. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that would be a drastic thing, but uh, but yeah, the hope. Most of the time, you have to be at bottom, or at least what you think is bottom before you'll reach up. I mean, it, it's just, humanity is just so crazy like that. We just won't learn the easy way, will we? I mean, no matter how hard God tries to teach us things the easy way, like putting it in his word, like instructing us to read his word, uh, 
encouraging us to read it, have preachers that preach it and everything else. And yet here we go many times having to learn the hard way. When, when, when the easy way would have been, all right, listen to God, do what God says, things will be fine. Do I do it? No, 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 I, I, have, to, I, have, to, I have to learn the hard way. How many times have you said that to your children? Why do you always have to learn the hard way? Or something in that vein. Well, there we are. That's a good picture of us and God. You know, God doesn't call us his children for no reason. I mean, the analogy is, uh, is intended by he's our heavenly father. Now, that's not just something he picked out of thin air to call himself. I mean, he wanted us to understand the same relationship. All right, let's move on. The law of order. All right, the law of order. Um, the law of order just basically says simple is better. Simple is better. Uh, yeah, but keep it simple. Silly man. Silly man. <laughs> so we're not going to say stupid. No, 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 no. Uh, 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 let all things be done. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. That means simple it is best. Uh, our lives can get so cluttered and so f full of stuff that they can just become non-manageable. Uh, I don't know about you, but confusion is, uh, uh, clutter is confusion to me. And, and, and whenever I'm around clutter, things that are cluttered up, it, it, it's not, it, it feels confused. It feels, like, well, it's like Nehemiah, as example, the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, was commissioned by God to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. The wall had been torn down. The wall was a symbol of God's protection and, 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 and of community. And so Ezra in the Bible was sent, he was a priest, he was sent to rebuild the temple. And at the same time, Nehemiah was sent to rebuild the wall around the city. And so in, the, in some of the passages where it talks about Nehemiah rebuilding the wall, man, they worked and they worked and all the men did their stuff and they had a sword in one hand and, they, and a, a trial in the other. They were building and protecting. And then it, one verse it says, and, and they had to stop because there was so much rubbish around that they couldn't continue building the wall. In other words, you can get your life so cluttered up that it impedes your progress. And so the encouragement from the Lord for our mind is let everything that we do be done decently and in order. In other words, in the simplest and the, and the least confusing way possible. If you're, if, you're in the, uh, if you're in the building trades or if you're uh, somebody that makes their living out of doing a service for somebody, uh, especially, I mean, I'm thinking the area of construction because I, I think that way. But every time I see something confused, here's what I think. More money, more money, more money. Because if I'm working for somebody and it's all confused and messed up and nobody knows what they want to do and where they want to go and there's junk laying everywhere and it's just a mess, I'm thinking, oh, more time. This is going to be more time. And, and so confusion, I mean, clutter is like that. So what it's doing is it's encouraging us to take the clutter out of our life. And you say, well, what, what do I need to do? Well, I mean, start with something simple like clean the garage. How about that? You know, uh, it's so funny because I know people, I know you're saying, now, come on, Pastor, this is like spiritual lessons here. Well, I'm just telling you that uh, the clutter that you live in uh, keeps your life out of order. And that when you walk into clutter, it just automatically begins to bring confusion. I, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you love clutter, but I, I don't know how. I, I don't have any relationship with that. When I see things cluttered up, it's just like it brings me down. It makes me feel like, you know, like things are just closing in on me. Yeah, like things are just closing in on me. It just takes away my frame of mind or thought about things, you know. And, um, and, and so... It's, it's better, it's more peaceful, it's, uh, it, it, it's more encouraging to you when you walk into places that are orderly, like, like this, you know? I mean, we had a service in here today, but look at it. 
I mean, it, it's all the chairs are in the place and the, everything's here. I mean, what if we walked in here tonight for this class and everything was just scattered everywhere and there was papers laying on the floor and trash here and there and half of these instruments, cords were stretched all over the stage and things were laying out and some were moved up there and some stands were turned over. And I mean, what, what would we feel? What would that make us feel like? It would say, we would say, man, there ain't no way we can go in there. You'd be so distracted by it. So I'm just saying, hey, start with something simple, uh, like the garage. It, it, you guys, get out there and clean the garage. Uh, we're the only country in the world, as far as I know, that will keep our garages filled with stuff we can't sell in the yard sale. <laughs> and we've tried it two or three times. And then leave parked out in the weather these fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 cars while we keep in our garage something we can't sell in the garage sale. Because there's so much clutter, we can't get our cars in there. I mean, they only build about a car and a half garage nowadays anyway. You know that, right? I mean, really, you know, we, we have garages that are called two-car garages. But if you have two regular-sized cars, you're going to have a little tight time getting them in there. I can guarantee you that. But, uh, but anyway, start with that. And then, and then uh, jump on over to your car and get that backhoe and clean out that back seat that's been needing to be cleaned out for since. You know, it's amazing to me. Have you ever, have you ever been, and I might be talking about you. I, don't, I, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying I'm talking about you. I'm just saying I might be talking about you, all right? But have you been in anybody's automobile that is so full of junk, clutter? And you're, you're saying to yourself, when you see that, you're saying, what in the world? How does somebody live with this? I mean, they got like hamburger wrappers and <laughs> pharmacy bags and, and chip bags. And the, and the stuff, something's ground, ground down in the back, back in there that you don't even want to guess what that is. And, you know, and it's just nasty. And the seats are stained and everything. And, it's just, and you're thinking to yourself, man, this is just nasty stuff right here. And you're thinking, why don't they just get the garbage out of who Who drives their automobile? And then just when they eat something, they just throw it in the back. Like, I mean, you know, like that's the garbage can back there. And, it, and then it, it, it's so full, you know, you're thinking, man, come on. You need to at least clean it out once a, a year here, you know, or something like that. But it just, anyway. And, and ladies, you know, it would be, it'd be real nice if, uh, if when your husband went to get a bowl of cereal in the morning that all that whole shelf of Tupperware didn't fall down on him, you know? I mean, that, that, and make up the bed. You know, I know I don't make up the bed. Tanya makes it up every day, though. Well, something that's simple is making up the bed gives me a sense of order. It just does. And I'm right. trying to use that to encourage the grandchildren Hadn't sunk in yet. You know, I think they have a generational curse going on here. Is what I'm, let me tell y'all what, what Amy used to do. Uh, she might actually even be watching this, but she knows because I've said it. I, I, you know what I told my children when they got old enough to understand? I said, I'm a pastor. God's called me to be a pastor. So here's what I'm going to tell y'all. Your whole lives are going to be illustrations. So don't, I mean, the reason God gave me children is so I could have illustrations for my sermons. You know, yeah. And uh, so they, have of course, that's been 30-something years ago, 37, 35. Anyway, point is, Amy, Amy, uh, Amy was, Amy's so unusual because uh, I don't know where she got this from because her genetics are a lot like mine, and y'all know her. You know, she looks, kind, she looks like me. I know uh, somebody, of course, she's got plenty of hair and stuff like that, but, uh, <laughs> but she, but her features, her features genetically look, look like my features. And, um, uh, you can tell that's my daughter, let's say it that way. And, uh, and her personality is a lot like that. And, and the things that she does and the things are a lot like, are a lot like me. And Justin's like his mama and, Tan and, and Amy's like me. And, and so I don't know where she got this from because I'm certainly not this way. <laughs> I'm, I'm the antithesis of this, actually. But when she, was a, when she was a teenager at home, Amy, you could go to her closet and open her closet door, and there would be like maybe two things hanging in that closet. And, and you would look under the bed, and under the bed was her wardrobe was <laughs> under the bed. And I looked at her. You could open the drawers, the chest of drawers and stuff like that, and it would be like mostly empty. And you'd look under the bed, and there would be the stuff that goes in the chest. 
And, and when you would tell her, you know, of course, we were on her, get your room cleaned up, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. And we would walk in there, and it, the room would look just immaculate, you know. And then you look under the bed, and under the bed is everything that ought to be in the closets and in the, in the drawers and everywhere else. And it was like, Amy, why do you do this? It would, it's more difficult to put it under there than it is to put it up over there. I mean, what is the deal with this? But she would do it, man, and I'm not sure, I guess, I'm not sure we ever broke her out of that. Did we, Tana? Well, She's not that way now. She does. She keeps it very neat, very, very orderly and all that. But, man, for those teenage years, it was something. It, it was a mess. And, uh, and, and, but Justin was just the opposite. He was, you know, he kept his place clean, and, um, and he still does. But anyway, uh, the law of order says that um, if you can bring order into your life, it's going to be a blessing to you. Mentally, it's going to be a blessing. Um, it's going to make things better. I, I don't know about you guys, but when stuff like when I have a leaky faucet or uh, my fan on my refrigerator squeaking or uh, the ice maker won't work or something, I mean, it just makes me feel like everything's broke down. I mean, you know, it makes me feel like my whole life is broken down, you know, and so we got to get it fixed or I got to call Billy or Brian and get it, get them up there to get it fixed or something or another, you know, and, and uh, but it, it's amazing how little things like that can affect your mentality and, and, and the way your life flows and what seems to be. I mean, you, you take it and you say, God, I want to be an excellent person. I, I, want to be, I want to be a person of excellence. Well, you know, you wouldn't expect to walk into a person of excellence home and it looks like a train wreck, right? I mean, you, if a person is excellent, if you say, man, I want to be like them, because they really got it going on, man. I mean, they're smart, they're successful, they're capable, they have a great family, they're, you know, man, they're just top. I would love to, oh, man, God, I want to be, give me, let me, give me a spirit like that. Let me be, and then when you went in their house, you wouldn't expect to walk into a train wreck, would you? You would expect to walk into a place that's what? That's clean, orderly, decent, and in order. Because that's what goes with an excellent life. And I'm just saying, practice being excellent. You know, keep your stuff orderly. Keep it neat. Keep it clean. Uh, if you start doing, if you start practicing this, you know, you can practice your way to some success with this. Uh, if you just start with this little simple thing, that attic, man, what's that attic full of? Stuff, right? Clean that junk out every now and then. I mean, just for the mental exercise of it, you know, the physical life of it. Uh, Tanya and I have had to move uh, several times uh, throughout the years. We've been eight churches, is that right, babe? In our 40-something years, eight churches. This is one of them. And um, anyway, so we've moved a few times. And what, has ha what we've noticed every time we've moved is, we, where did all of this junk come from? And how did we have all of this in our house? So we've learned over the years how to throw stuff away. And if you don't use it, well, they tell us with clothes, if you don't wear it within a year, you're not going to wear it. Take it to Goodwill or give it to somebody you know or heaven. I, do they buy, do, do clothes sell good in yard sales? They don't usually sell good, do they? Clothes are, people like these little knickknacks and whatnots and little trinkets and stuff like that. They don't really like clothes and stuff, do they? Yeah, I mean, you know. But anyway, uh, get rid of stuff like that because uh, it, it clutter really messes you up. All right, let's, let's move on. Let's move on. The law of peace, which really goes right with, <laughs> with the law of order. Um, the law of peace says sometimes I need to unplug. Let me just encourage you on this. Let me tell you. Do, do you guys, the world that we're living in right now, I, of course, I'm, I'm almost 62. So I've been around for a while, and I know for some of you, you go, oh, you're just a kid. Well, you know, thank you, and I really appreciate that. I love to be around people that I'm a kid to, you know. <laughs> it's like hot dog. I get to be young again. But I've been around a while, and I can just tell you that in my lifetime, I have never seen our country in, in as crazy a time as it is in now. I mean, it is just ridiculous. And if you stay wrapped up in that mess, your life is going to be ridiculous. 
you're gonna, it, it's going to mess you up. What I'm saying is unplug from that junk. Quit watching the news. Who cares what they think anyway? I mean, that's just their opinion about stuff. That's not God speaking. And that doesn't matter because whatever, whatever's going to happen is going to happen uh, according to what God says about the way this world winds down, winds up, in and out, and all that stuff. That's one of the reasons why I'm going to start preaching on the book of Revelation here in just a short time. I believe because God's put it in my heart, he's given me a, a desire to, to expose uh, what he has to say about some things in these end days that we're in because I think we are in them, and I don't know how long they might last. It might be the next hundred years because nobody knows. The scripture says not even Jesus knows the day or the hour. And the reason Jesus doesn't know is because he would have told us if he knew because he told us everything God, everything God told him. He said, God speaks to me so I can speak to you. So God didn't tell him, hey, this is when you're coming back and tell them to be ready and all that and don't let it slip up on them. But the Bible's full of indications and pointers and signs and everything about different things. And, and what we're in right now is just totally, I mean, you could read, you can just, you can read it just like it's the book of, of Revelation or Ezekiel or Daniel. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just ridiculously close to, to all of the things the scripture talks about about end times thing being. And in the law of peace, I'm just saying to you is, if you want to have peace, you're going to have to unplug from this mess. In other words, there's times when you just need to, you need to drive home without the radio blaring. You know, you need to walk into the house and there don't need to be a TV on in every room in the house. You need to have some place you can go. Sometimes you just need to walk out on the back porch I mean, you made the thing beautiful and nice as you possibly could. You put chairs out there. You put a port swing out there. Why did you do that? So you could go out there and drink a cup of coffee and sit on the back porch and enjoy life. Get you some bug spray and just go to town, you know. <laughs> Try not to spray it in your coffee and, you know, <laughs> just, just have a good time in life and, and, and without a bunch of racket and a bunch of noise and a... And, and, and a and something that irritates you and aggravates you and annoys you and gets your blood pressure up and all of that kind of stuff. Because in order for your mind to recover, it has to have peace. Your mind is not going to recover in confusion or stress. If your mind is going to recover, if your mind is going to be renewed and you're going to regain strength and emotion and, 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 and the spizzerinkum of life, if you're going to if you're going to get that, you're going to have to be at some peace, you know, in some places. And so I'm just, the law of peace just basically says what Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. Listen to this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now listen to this. He makes me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He has to make me do it. Why? Because I won't lay down in a green pasture. I'm too busy. I got too much going on. So the psalmist says, sometimes the Lord has to make me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, quiet waters, uninterrupted waters, not roaring waterfalls and, you know, fast water. He leads me beside still water in order to do what? To restore my soul. So God says to us, if you want your soul restored, and remember, what is your soul? Your soul is your seat of intellect, your seat of decision, your seat of will. You're listening to me with your soul right now. Your soul is what makes choices and makes decisions. Your soul is your personality and all of that. So to restore my soul, everything that I am, God has to lead me. God has to make me sometimes lie down in green pastures. You know, I, I, one of the things that I, that I want to say to the Lord is, I don't really want to live a life where you have to make me lie down in green pastures. Because I have a feeling that uh, that might be a pretty drastic kind of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, to make me. God has to make me lie down in green pastures. Uh-oh, I don't want that. I want to do it voluntarily. How about that? So I'm going to make some choices in my life. I'm going to choose some things. And I'm going to choose to have 
an opportunity to break weight. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to do that all day, every day, or that you even have to do it every day. I mean, some days you're not going to be able to come home uh, to quietness and some peace. Some, there are going to be some days when life just doesn't happen that way. So, okay, we deal with that. But when you have a choice, at least occasionally, say to yourself, look, when I get home, I'm not going to turn on that TV. I'm not going to watch that mess. I'm going to I'm going to get me a cup of coffee. I'm going to get me a soda and I'm going to go out on that back porch. I'm going to turn my fans on and 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 I'm going to, you know, get my bug spray and I'm going to just and I'm staying out here and I'm going to swing on this porch swing and just rest a minute. And just withdraw yourself. <laughs> What, Gene, you don't, your back porch isn't big enough to have a swing on it? Is that what you said? <laughs> no, I said I'm going to run you a bubble pad. Run you a bubble <laughs> pad? You're right, though. Her back porch is not big enough. <laughs> We're going to have to build you a deck out there yeah. and put and cover it. Yeah, yeah. that's what we need to do. And then, right, and then you can stay in your bubble bath until then. Well, you know, and see, that's right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, right. And you can run that big garden tub that, that every one of us wanted in our house so bad that when we walked in the bathroom, when we were looking at our house, we were going to buy, the first thing we looked for in the bathroom was a garden tub, big garden tub, whirlpool bath, whatever it is. And that was so important. When's the last time you've been in it? Six years ago? Yeah, six years ago. You've never been. <laughs> See, like ours, ours, we don't get in it enough. Uh, that we, we get in there, and we and when we want to turn the blowers on, uh, uh, algae comes blowing out of there. <laughs> because we don't get in enough to keep the algae blown out of it, you know? And uh, it's amazing. And yet, we probably paid $5,000 more for the house because it had one of them in there. And we don't ever use it. Well, use that thing, man. Get in there and cut the lights off and have one little romantic candle or something. Get you a little book, you know, whatever, and, and then and just unplug from life and let peace flow over your life. You know, David said it like this in Psalms. He said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I might fly away and be at rest. And even though we don't have any wings and we can't fly, and even if we could fly, we would be there. And if we're there, sin is there. And if sin is there, Satan is there. So even though we don't have wings and we can't really fly, the sentiment of that is to unplug. And that's exactly what we need to do sometimes. And I think we will find ourselves enjoying life a whole lot better and our minds and our souls could recover and God wouldn't, we wouldn't make God put us down in green pastures if we would just obediently do that some. All right, um, let's see a look at a question here. Uh, read Psalm 23, 2 and 3 again. Imagine yourself in such a place. God lay down in green pastures, quiet, still waters. How do you think it would affect you emotionally, physically, and spiritually? Did anybody answer that question? I stop, I go to sleep. You go to sleep? Well, you know, maybe that's what you need. If I sit down, I go to sleep. That's maybe that's what you need. Because you are such a busy person, man. You have such a demanding job in life. A good gracious, man. Just the driving and stuff that you do is amazing to this me. Quiet, yeah, really. I don't drive with the radio. Yeah, you just drive. You're just quiet when you drive. Well, yeah, see, that's, really, that's peace. He wasn't talking, wasn't nobody talking. Well, he. <laughs> well, and he certainly is talking, though. Isn't <laughs> His eyes are open. His <laughs> eyes are open. He's talking. <laughs> If I get to where I can't talk, <laughs> I'll start signing. Yeah, right. That's exactly. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you. That's right. I'm gonna tell y'all something now. Seriously, there's only there's only one other person I know on this earth that I know personally now that uh, has as many stories as Billy does in life, and that, and that, and that's our brother Don. Uh, he has he can he can tell stories from one end to the other. I'm telling you, he can tell. And he can tell you details, times, names, places. He just goes down the list. Billy's just like that. Billy has a whole life full of stories. I think he can remember everything that ever happened to him in his entire life. 
Yeah, I yeah. That's right, Billy. Billy said, now, there was one, now listen, y'all, there was one time that I saw this, and if, I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it. But we, Billy and I were over at Lawrence and Bev's house, and we were on the back porch, and, uh, and we were sitting back there and enjoying life, and Billy and, and Lawrence were telling stories yeah. back and forth. You know, one would tell one, and another one would tell one a little bit bigger, and then another one would tell one a little bit bigger, and a little, little bit bigger, and stuff like that. And now listen, and Lawrence come up, now seriously, Lawrence came up with this parrot that could talk. And uh, Billy said, that's it, I give up, I quit. I, can, I can't top this parrot that can talk, you know? A crow, that's right, a crow that can talk. A crow that could talk. And Billy said, that's it for me, I can't top that, that talking crow. I was talking about a chicken, I heard holler, help. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Was that one from my house? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was one. That was one. I rest my case. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> oh my God. See? Now there you go. Peace. 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 Peace is what we're talking about. All right, yeah. 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 Don't pass. Yeah. Because I've never been able just to stay alive. Zone out. Like, don't bath and be like, ah, oh, it's not going to happen. Well, you know, the thing about it is uh, God made us all different. Uh, he made our personalities and our abilities and everything all different. And, and what would be, and at times, now seriously, at times what would seem to be uh, disorder and disarray and confusion for me, because of the way God made me and what I'm, my personality and my nature's like, would, would be, that would be, you know, drudgery to you. And the way you, your life works and your mind and all that uh, would be terrible for me because God didn't create me like that. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing when we use words like peace and joy and words like that, those are, those are buzz words. Uh, and by buzz words, I mean we all have a concept of what we mean when we say words like that. And as soon as those words are said, that image pops into our brain about what that word means. And so unless we can change the definition of that, then we're always going to interpret a word a certain way. Like, I'll give you an example, and this is just, just a, for, so you can, can see. All right, when, when, I use, when I say the word conservative, what pops into your mind? Now, don't tell me out loud, but for some people, when they hear the word conservative, 
What pops in their mind is somebody in white sheets and hoods, somebody who is uh, non-tolerant, somebody who uh, is, a, is a prejudiced person and, and, and hates everybody but themselves and people just like them. That's what they hear when they hear the word conservative, and that's because that's their concept. So when you use that word, no matter what you're, you mean by it, that's what they see, or the word liberal, or the word charismatic. The word charismatic, you see people jumping over pews, swinging on chandeliers, jumping up, speaking in tongues, you know, but the word charismatic, it comes from charisma, which just means gifted. We're all charismatics. We're all gifted by God. But see, but, but when I say the word, you have a picture in your mind and you jump right to that picture. So the word peace, you know, what, what is peace? Well, peace is, is a resting of your mind. Peace is a, is a settling of your heart. And if going through scenarios in life settles your heart or gives you some kind of um, uh, closure on something or uh, gives you the ability to strategize about what you should do about it or what you should think about it, then it, it, to you, that's peace. Whereas to Gene, peace might be sitting there in a bubble bath uh, thinking about, you know, what color is this rose? You know, that kind of thing, <laughs> you know. But, but that's because that's, that's her peace. And your peace is, is different, you know. Uh, some people, to, to try to think about completely clearing my mind and not be thinking about anything, that's, that's torture to them. That would be like, what would, how would I do that? And you would just be torturing yourself trying to eliminate everything from your mind. But that's because we've been taught that peace means the absence of any conflict. But, but peace means, I mean, I can have peace in the midst of the storm. The old song says, you know, he gave me peace in the midst of the storm. The, water, the wind can be blowing, the water splashing and howling and everything else. And I can have peace, not because my environment is non-chaotic, but because my mind <coughs> is calm in the presence of whatever's going on around me. So, you know, peace can, I'm just saying peace, and I'm not trying to cop out on that. It's just a fact, because if, if everybody's definition of peace was what I think, then you would be dissatisfied about a lot of things. And if it was what you think, I probably would be too, you know? Well, for so some, it's, being in a house all alone is peaceful. Right. For others, being in a house full of family and friends is peaceful. Yeah. Or being in the house And that's you. I know it. And see that? <laughs> and that right there. And there with is the problem. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's not me. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I don't have any trouble with that. Um, well, I have very little trouble. Well, I have some trouble with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to get over it, in other words. But, um, yeah, yeah, right. That's exactly right. I've got to tell the truth up here, as opposed to other times when I don't. You know, I've, I've, heard, preacher, <laughs> I've heard preachers say, now I'm telling you the truth, and I'm thinking, as opposed to what? You usually lie to us, or what? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you always told the truth. Why you got to tell us you're telling the truth? <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, so anyway, uh, th well, there you go. Uh, now, does that kind of beat around the answer to that? Because it's, it, it, that's really the reality of it. And it's just like hope, you know. Hope is one of those words that we have buzzword. I mean, it, it, you know, because we've been trained when we hear somebody talk about it to think a certain thing like they mean this this is what they mean and then we have this image in our in our mind about what hope would be or what peace would be or you know and that kind of thing but it's uh god created us differently and that's one of the great things about the word it just it the concepts in the word and the values that the word teaches are so diverse that uh the way God created us, it, it can, everything can fit into those, to, to the way God created us. And what is peace to you, Tanya's peace, is a, a house full of children, grandchildren running out, yelling, happy, happy, happy and joyful, happy and joyful and busy and laughing and, and giggling and, and being uh, excited about life, little fellas. That's peace to her. Me is to shut the bedroom door 
and turn on Sports Center, you know, something like that. Now, now I'm at peace. All right, good. There you go. And don't knock on that door either, you know. <laughs> When somebody's not there, it's just like, well, where is so-and-so? Exactly. Yeah, exactly, right. There's like 14 kids in there going around and around and around, and then she misses one. Yeah. I have a question. Um, you're saying, like, for everybody who's saying has different things, like, you know, they have different mm -hmm. things that, um, like, for example, like, you know, I have a certain friend, like, she just always seems she's not at peace with anything. Like, even if she can be having a good day, it's something just... Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the, the only thing you could do is to engage whatever, the, whatever it is that's being said. If you're going to try to help change that mindset, then I when mean, you're... I'm not trying to change them, but help them find To get past, yeah, right. Well, and, and what you do is uh, when, when, you, when this is exhibited, when this kind of statement or whatever it is that tells you this person is, is not at peace even though there really isn't a need to be shook up about something and an overreaction and all that and and then you just find a way to um, say that to them like you know hey you know that's not that bad really that's look that's you got a great life look at this this is going on this is great in your life i i think one of yeah i think one of the things and this is something now that i think i want you all to get hold of because this is really I'm telling you, it's, it's really important in life is, is to, to live life with gratitude, with, with thankfulness to the Lord about our lives because the enemy, the devil, the, the world, the society that we live in encourages us to be, to be unthankful, to be, to, to be neglectful, to, to, thank God and praise God for the blessings in our life, but to look only to the things we don't have and gripe and grumble and complain about those things as if our whole life is, is not been blessed by God in any way. And, and what I mean is like, all right, look at your life. You're, you're, you're living in a great home. You're in a wonderful community. You're surrounded by people that are nice people and want the same things that you do and have the same values that you do and and your children are are all successful and doing and 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 yet somehow you you feel like that life hadn't changed a bit for you that you're still complaining about the stuff you complained about 20 years ago as if all of that hasn't even happened in your life totally overlooking every great thing that's happened in order to live in the past and to and to still have the same feelings and stuff and and see that's just that's a lack of gratitude in life and 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 it keeps you from going forward and being blessed and enjoying the blessings of God and we grumble and we complain about everything and murmur about all of that kind of stuff and and life's not good and I'm being mistreated and we're not you know I mean just all kinds of attitudes are in there not because of what's really happening but because we don't see the greatness of God. We don't see the, the graciousness of God. We, we discount that totally, and we go straight to those things that the, that, that the enemy wants to exalt in our life to keep us upset and, and not moving forward in life. So anyway, look at life that way. All right, hey, it's past time. We got two more to go. We'll get them next week, huh? All right, praise the Lord. Any, any, anybody have any more questions or anything that I can answer in about 30 seconds or, you know, anything like that? All right. All right. All right. Let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed. We'll start with uh, purity next week, okay? And we're going to do the other five, too. So move on to, the, move, move on to your mouth, okay? Go ahead and, go ahead and study the next five because it's going to be there, all right? Hey, I appreciate you guys participating like this. Y'all are a talkative bunch, and that's good. Because it's in that kind of stuff that we get to the truth a lot of times. You know, because a lot of times I can get off on some wild rabbit chase somewhere or something or another, and just we won't get the truth at all. I, I think the Lord speaks to us uh, when we expose things and, and thoughts and, and, and we can clarify things and really work it out. I think that's the best 
for us. So don't be afraid. Like I said, I don't care how much we cover. Uh, one point or all of them is fine with me because as far as I know, we're gonna, I'm going to be here next week, and I hope you will be too. And so there's no reason to rush through this because, I mean, is what we're going to go to next any more important than what we're in right now? So, you know, why rush through what we're in right now to get to something else as if it's more important? It's all important. Every bit of it's important. You came because you want your life to be affected by the Spirit of God. You want to learn and grow. You want to be a part of, of, of uh, developing yourself in excellence. And um, so sometimes it just takes a little time. I have to talk around some stuff, all right? So I just, I just encourage you. It's a good thing. It's a good thing.